The governor wins some and loses some in the veto session, and the State House comes under a spotlight in the discussion of sexual harassment. We'll talk about it next on Capitol View. Welcome to Capital View, the program where we talk about state issues, sometimes federal issues, and how they just might affect your life. I'm Bernie Schoenberg from the State Journal Register. The legislature was in session this last week, so there's a lot to talk about. Um, with me today to discuss these things, Matt Dietrich is back. He is a reporter with the Better Government Association and PolitiFact Illinois. Welcome back, Matt. Thank you, Bernie. And Hannah Meisel is also back, State House reporter for Law 360. Welcome. Glad to be here. Okay. Um, legislature came into session. It's been an interesting summer for Governor Bruce Rauner. Uh, he vetoed many bills and uh, some were taken up and the legislature has started dealing with some. They, they have to go through both houses. So the action so far is, um, you know, major vetoes have been through one house or the other. So final action has yet to come because of course to override a veto, you have to go through both. But one of those issues uh, was local right to work zones. And this, I think we could call that, at least for now, a win for the governor. Um, Matt, you wanna talk about that one? The legislature passed a bill. We know the governor has talked about, mm -hmm. uh, he wants to lower costs on local government. To him, that means right to work, which means, uh, and you can call it other things, that you, people do not have to join a union even if they're right. in, a, in a union shop. Um, and he went all around the state when he was a new governor, uh, urging communities to pass their own right to work ordinances. Lincolnshire did, that's yes. st stuck in court right now. Mm -hmm. um, uh, but the legislature passed a law saying local communities can't do that, he vetoed it. They over, it, was that one overridden in the Senate, I think? Or, yes. Uh, yes, overwhelmingly. Mm -hmm. Overwhelmingly, in an overwhelmingly Democratic Senate. In the House, it fell one vote short of an override, although there'll be a chance to, to bring it back. Right. So. Um, that was a, a big one for him. Yeah, that was uh, the local right to work zones was a big component of his turnaround agenda. When he was running for office and then when he was first elected, that was one of the big centerpieces. And what the idea was is let local governments decide if you want to make a, a yourself a, a right to work community so that uh, if you have a company with a union shop, you could not compel employees who are working under a union contract to be members of the union uh, or to pay f what are called fair share fees. Right. Um, it, that is something that proved to be extremely unpopular. and With a Democratic legislature. With a Democratic legislature, right. but also uh, as he went around the state, you mentioned you know Lincolnshire and some other places, uh, it really got labor up and they showed up at these meetings. And what one interesting thing that happened with the local right to work zone idea is that uh, before Long Rounder took that off the table, and then he tried to make that into a you know uh, a very big bargaining point with with the Democrats when they were during the budget standoff, where he would say you know I've taken things off the table, right. the local right to work zones. I'm not pushing that. I've taken that off the table, <laughs> and it wasn't going to go anywhere. Well, and he's also often tried in some of his other negotiations to put elements of that in, like, you know, right. he, he often talks about, you know, if we're going to have property tax freeze or whatever, we should also, you know, give local governments relief. And I think some right. of that is sometimes you don't have to bargain collectively if you don't want with certain unions. I, I think also, too, on the uh, House override vote, I believe it fell one short, but I think there was a Democrat, Sam Yingling, Sam Yingling maybe, who wasn't there. North suburbs, right. On the other hand, if you're that close and it's that important to the governor, maybe if Sam Yingling comes back, uh, then when the veto some, session uh, starts up again, will, will another vote, yeah, Republican might you know, take mm -hmm. a walk. If it's that close, it, I guess it would be difficult for this override to happen. It looks like, Hannah, do you mm -hmm. agree with that? or? Yeah, I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. But for now, like you said, uh, victory, the governor claimed victory yesterday. Uh, on Wednesday, we film uh, Thursdays, and um, you know he said this is a victory for local control. You know, for local communities to get their economies moving. Uh, like you mentioned, um, in 2015, when uh, the governor was brand new in office, only a handful of communities have been took it up, and either it was voted down or ignored. And the village of Lincolnshire did pass it, but 
Um, last, uh, ja or this past January, a federal judge struck it down. It's now pending in the Seventh Circuit. And uh, another interesting fact is that the Sixth Circuit actually uh, upheld local right to work zones in Kentucky, a very similar concept. Mm -hmm. And if the S Seventh Circuit does not follow that, then it sets up a circuit split, which would make it right for the Supreme Court to take up. Um, and it would be another union uh, issue emanating from Illinois because, as we remember, the governor's original suit uh, fighting share f fair share fees is also now pending. Mm -hmm. Right, court. and he, he's actually given speeches where he looks to the Supreme Court to help solve Illinois' mm -hmm. what he calls problem of um, particularly public sector unions where, right. because uh, this is a case of a state worker saying, I shouldn't have sure. to pay any, f any uh, dues to a union I, I don't really believe in while I work for the state in a union shop. Um, and the governor is hoping that he hasn't been able to do that legislatively, but of course we have Neil Gorsuch is the new uh, right. conservative right. member of the Supreme Court, uh, uh, named by President Trump, and that seems to say that uh, this could, you know, a lot of people think there's this will not go the union's way. Uh, there's when every indication that it's not going to go the right. union's mm -hmm. way, and there was every indication before Scalia died that it, that that case would have gone against the unions as well. So this is just kind of a makeup for that. So. You know, we don't know for certain. You never know at the Supreme Court. Okay. It's interesting, we'll have another, if that were to happen, uh, we already have the Rutan case from 1990, which is a major labor case pertaining to patronage that emanated from Springfield. Right, which now says, we could which says you can't in, uh, hire people for non-top mm -hmm. positions, for just run-of-the-mill rank-and-file positions. You, politics right. cannot be involved in that decision. So now we could have Wait, the it's actually take case it, uh, yes. emanating from Springfield. So. That we we're really we have all kinds of national things come out of here. We, yes, we, we have Blagojevich come we're out of here, but that's that was a different kind of federal case. <laughs> but anyway, um, also on uh, in in the veto session, uh, the House voted overwhelmingly, in fact, unanimously, w with 112 to nothing, to override uh, something that uh, Comptroller Susana Mendoza was pushing for, called the Debt Transparency Act. We have, as of the middle of this week, the, the state comptroller's office showed more than $16 billion in unpaid bills. We do have the new tax increase that the governor, he had agreed to that level, but now is saying it's a terrible thing and should be rolled back because the legislature passed it, uh, passed that income tax this summer. But the comptroller says that state agencies sometimes, they only have to report now once a year on how much in bills they're holding back that the comptroller may not even know about. Comptroller wants reports each month from each agency so that she has a better idea how much debt is in the pipeline, so what, who should be paid first uh, to avoid a problem. She went around to editorial boards all across the state and worked with legislators uh, and ended up uh, with bipartisan support complete, got 112 um, to nothing in the House to override the governor's veto. The veto said, the governor said in his veto message that he thought the comptroller was trying to micromanage state government. Uh, her argument is, well, any business should get reports at least monthly on how much they owe. Uh, Hannah, this was, I guess it seems like the governor must have taken the pressure off legislators because they could see the writing on the wall, this was going to be overridden. Yeah. <laughs> and, you know, I think the interesting thing is the uh, two-year budget impasse really revealed the inner workings of how bills get paid, and it's definitely not always pretty um, when you have to prioritize one payment over another, um, you know, and leave people waiting for still months when you save up for days to, you know, make a million dollar payment to, you know, such and such a uh, place that gets state support. And so I think that, um, you know, Comptroller Mendoza and to some extent uh, Leslie Munger before her, they really uh, push this idea that our bills are worse than you think. And, uh, you know, this uh, Debt Transparency Act is probably a good move, uh, you know, not just for the inner workings of the state and the comptroller's office, but also just for, uh, you know, voters to right. have a little so bit no. more transparency. Well, and it's interesting that you mentioned Leslie Munger, who was the Republican comptroller named by Governor Rauner. Mm -hmm. She is now a deputy governor to him and actually put out a statement supporting him in, in this that, you know, we really don't need this, but she's now on his team and Mendoza kind of won the public support on this one. Well, you have to look at what happened with the bill backlog. Uh, there was this budget impasse. It was hovering, I think in June, it was in the 14, 15 mm -hmm. billion dollars. 
now all of a sudden it grows by 2.8 billion because suddenly the agencies release their bills to be paid because there's an appropriation to pay them. And I know as a reporter, and Bernie, I'm sure you've done this before, uh, a few years ago, when you were gonna report on the state's bill backlog before there was a nice website that told you, you had to call over there, and they'd give you two different numbers. They'd say, well, the bill backlog right now is X billion dollars, but we think that there are also another billion being held mm -hmm. by the agency, mm -hmm. so really it's more like the X. Mm -hmm. This bill would prevent that. You'd be able to go onto the ledger website and the figure that you'd see is actually how much the state owes. Yeah, well, uh, it is ex widely expected that the Senate will follow suit and that the governor's agencies will just start having to uh, report monthly. Uh, governor has said we needed more money for computers and we don't really mm -hmm. have the, you know, this is gonna be a lot of work. That was part of his veto, veto message too. The comptroller says, basically bunk, <laughs> you know, you can do this. Uh, and, and there have been conflicts about how much money the Rounder administration is paying for computers or what they did with the money they got. And Mendoza right. says, we're not going to pay your consultants. Nothing has really happened in all this time you've been talking about it. So, you I know, think obviously- I think the figure was like $21 million that uh, didn't get paid for his, for the computer upgrades mm -hmm. that the governor had wanted. And that money went instead to, to some other things. But you, you know, $21 million is in the scope of a $16 billion backlog is fairly small. But you look at some of the the social service agencies that were owed money, uh, you know, if you're a small drug rehab center or something like that. Like the one that closed in Jacksonville, the Wells Center, and if you're, because of the impasse. And yeah. if you're owed half a million dollars, that is huge. Yeah. That is the difference between staying open and closing. It's the difference of being able to take in new patients or keep staff on. So, you know, we look at this bill backlog like $16 billion as some monolith, but within that, think of all of those small businesses that are affected. Absolutely. Uh, that, you know, several hundred thousand dollars can mean the difference between being in business and being out of business. Yeah. One, one of the other, uh, we'll move on to some other things shortly, but uh, one of the other override votes was, they call it a gender pay equity. Uh, and I think, Matt, you were talking about this mm -hmm. before we started taping today. <laughs> uh, and I think, uh, was it the, is it the Attorney General, Lisa Madigan, behind this one? I'm not sure. I, I do not Maybe know. Maybe not this one. I okay. don't know for certain. Uh, but this basically says uh, in it's going to make employers not ask your previous pay when they hire you for your new job. Mm -hmm. Is that right? And which well, is supposed to be a, a gen, you know, to help uh, balance the difference in pay between men and women. And, and right. It's built on the gender pay inequity. If, if you're a woman and you're being paid less, than a male would get in your job and then you're trying to advance to a new job in the same field and a prospective employer looks at what you made last time, they may not offer you the same as, uh, uh, as, as what you deserve, what you should get. Um, and I, I saw something today that uh, as of this point forward in the year is when due to the pay inequity, gender pay inequity from this point through December 31st, women work free yeah. in the American yeah. workplace. Is that true, Hannah? So <laughs> 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 yeah. anyway, anyway, the House overrode the governor's veto of this, yeah. and the, the governor apparently saying this is a, a didn't difficulty for business that we don't need at this he, point. He wanted, um, I don't know too much about the Massachusetts legislation that the governor wanted to, mo he said, you know, I don't like what's being proposed, but I do support this Mas Massachusetts legislation mm -hmm. um, sponsor, Anna, Anna Moeller, in the House. She said, you know, there are too many loopholes with the Massachusetts legislation. We got to go with this one that we crafted. It, I, I was a little surprised that, to, I mean, to me, this one kind of flew under the radar. And I think it's, it's pretty significant. Yeah, I mean, I, I'm not terribly far out of school. And I remember being told that, you know, your first salary is very, very important because that the shadows will follow you. Right. Yeah, well, we'll, we'll see where that goes. And that uh, still has to go through the Senate, which with the overwhelmingly Democratic Senate may well do so. So we'll see w what that does. Uh, speaking of gender, uh, you know, Harvey Weinstein, the uh, now uh, disgraced uh, Hollywood movie mogul, uh, who dozens of women have said he either harassed or uh, said or did inappropriate things with them. Uh, this has come down to the state house level. There was an open letter within the last uh, week or so that circulated uh, among people working at, in and around the Illinois State House, 
I'll just read a couple of, and it's been signed by, I think it's more than 160 people on Facebook, um, and it's, you know, hashtag me too. It's time to demand no more in Illinois. Uh, it looks, and they say what they're describing, the kind of harassment. They talk about a local bar and a restaurant, and on any given session night in Springfield where it's clear a woman must endure the crude jokes and untoward advances of male colleagues and legislators if she wants to garner support for her work. Another sentence, it looks like the willful ignorance of every colleague who sees this behavior and ignores it, dismisses it as locker room talk, and shrugs it off because boys will be boys, and that's just how men talk. Um, so there is awareness now that uh, people are talking about long-time problem at the State House that uh, women, even you know, women legislators, uh, lobbyists, uh, staffers, having to put up with stuff they shouldn't have to put up with. Um, is this changing the culture, or how's it going over there, Hannah? <laughs> <laughs> um, it's You've been an intern. You're a reporter at the State House. Yeah. So, yeah. I mean, I don't think there's any woman that we know that ha doesn't have at least a couple of anecdotes where they've been made to feel uncomfortable. Um, just yesterday, I sl stepped in an elevator and you know, with the man, and he said, oh, I don't think you should be um, riding an elevator alone with a man these days. And clearly, he was joking about this, but like, you know. So is it being taken seriously? By lots of people, yeah. But um, it's going to take a lot to me, as we all know and have experienced, mm -hmm. um, is still an old boys club, no matter you know what year it is. I think uh, it's going to take a long time, because people need to circulate through, and n new ideas need to come uh, in, and people need to be called out, especially older people who have never been uh, subjected to this kind of scrutiny in their behavior. So, um, you know, a couple months ago, I could have at least raised the argument, well, one of the four legislative leaders is a woman, which was Christine <laughs> Redonio of Lamont, mm -hmm. although after 20 years in the legislature, she, you know, uh, resigned and, and went back to the family and spent more time. And obviously, she is an example that women can certainly rise to leadership positions. You, you know, you look at uh, Barbara Flynn Curry, top of lieutenant to Speaker Madigan in the House, very well respected. Um, on the other hand, clearly, uh, this is a nationwide problem, in particularly in places with people with power, companies, governments, yes. like everywhere. Right, Matt? And, and power is mm -hmm. the key word. You look at the, the Weinstein, uh, the Weinstein allegations came out, uh, and and clearly, you know, he was able to do this for so long, and people were so afraid to speak out because he had this power, and they were afraid that if I speak out, then. I'm never going to go anywhere in yeah, Hollywood. You're going to be blacklisted. Right. And now another thing, uh, you know, regarding the State House environment, and Bernie, you and I worked together for a long time at the State Journal Register mm -hmm. under two different corporate ownerships. And I think in, in a setting like that, when the, the Journal Register was owned by Copley Press and then when it was owned by Gatehouse, corporations are in a better situation to uh, give training on stuff like this. I remember we had to watch films. We still do. About <laughs> Every it. year we do. You had to, you had to take mm -hmm. an online test mm -hmm. about it. You were aware of it. Right. And, uh, you know, you were made to know that this, this is what the behavior looks like, okay? Right. You and if you think this film is funny or you don't get it, then you've got a problem. Right. In the State House, you've got 177 members who are basically from all different backgrounds everywhere. You got lobby, you know, there is no one, you have your legislative leaders, you know, your caucus leaders, I suppose, but you don't have a unifying uh, force. Right. Well, it's interesting you bring that up because training, that kind of training, which I think it's getting better and better over time. Uh -huh. I remember the first time you watch it, you know, some of it, I mean, they, they do business ethics film and they do sexual harassment film. But it does alert you that maybe a comment you thought was okay is not okay. Exactly right. Uh, and it, and some people probably need to be hit over the over the head with this. So there is <laughs> that. I, I know Daniel Biss, a state senator and candidate for governor, Democratic side, and his lieutenant governor candidate Letitia Wallace from Rockford, and uh, she's in the House. They're sponsoring a training kind of legislation. Mm -hmm. Speaker Madigan has apparently taken this on. Candidates for governor. Uh, have put out statements or either on Twitter or in other statements. Uh, Chris Kennedy, uh, uh, Mr. Uh, J.B. Pritzker, both very emphatically saying, you know, let's change the culture. 
so there will probably be some kind of legislation about training for state house staff right. and even legislators, and they're going to learn how to sit through that too and fi maybe find out what's inappropriate. Mm -hmm. um, so, uh, are we uh, are we uh, into optimistic about change in the culture? Like I said, <laughs> not this, so, not kind, that of, this kind of change takes a, takes a really, really long time because mm. uh, people's behavior is so ingrained, especially right. if you are very old, uh, older. Thank you very much. <laughs> <Hey>. <laughs> Excuse <Yeah>. me, I'm <laughs> so sorry. That's okay. uh, very powerful. <laughs> you know, if well, you've worry, never then. been uh, called out on your behavior, um, you know, you've just gotten away with this years and years, decades. It's going to take a lot for you to uh, look at your own behavior and say, oh, I get that this is affecting right. the women around me, even some of the men around me. You know, it's going to take a long time. It's going to take yeah. commitment by people everywhere to call out their friends, mm -hmm. their colleagues. Yeah, and it's always it's difficult to do, mm -hmm. e even in, this, in an atmosphere where things are more open. Yeah. Um, on to politics a bit. Governor Bruce Runner, uh, in a two-minute video with him fully decked out in his motorcycle gear, riding motorcycle through past uh, dilapidated factories and housing in Illinois and saying how terrible it is, but he's going to stand and fight uh, for the state that he's now been governor of for two and a half years. Uh, formally announced by video last week and then did some interviews uh, that he's running for re-election. We knew this. He put $50 million already months ago into his campaign. Um, and this comes at a time after he had uh, signed House Bill 40, which is, uh, expands Medicaid abortion, mm -hmm. state, you know, public paid abortion to uh, people on Medicaid, which angered many pro-life people in the particularly Republican base. Actually, both parties probably, but the pro-life base, wh a lot of uh, the Republican Party kind of meshes with that. Um, and now there's talk that he might get a uh, challenge in the primary, possibly from a conservative representative from Wheaton, Gene Ives. Um, how's it looking for the governor? Was it a fair rollout, on the, a two-wheel rollout? Um, my, what I was wondering is, as I watch the World Series and I see a uh, commercial with the governors of Missouri and Wisconsin and Indiana talking, talking about how bad things are in Illinois, uh, paid for by Bruce Rauner. I wonder, um, is anyone from Amazon watching these commercials? Do Interesting, because Illinois they? is trying to get Amazon's right. second headquarters with 50,000 possible employees mm -hmm. in the Chicago area. Mm -hmm. yeah. Now, uh, normally in a, in a re-election campaign, you'd be running on your accomplishments and uh, the governor is starting to kind of roll out this thing. I reformed education funding in Illinois. I signed the new education funding bill. Right. Uh, Even but, though he had, he had vetoed parts of it in the past and right. talked about a Chicago bailout before the final bill he signed, which had more money for Chicago than the one he complained was a bailout. Exactly right. Yeah. Uh, and so, he, it, it, so you're going to see more of these kinds of ads, I think, because he does not have a whole lot of accomplishments to right. tell. Right. Uh, Rewatching the video ad before, you know, came, coming here, I feel like he's really framing this election as like halftime. Like, you know, in every good sports movie, there is like, you're, you're down by a lot <laughs> and you, you go to halftime and, you know, you get this amazing pep talk. So it's, he's uh, framing it as the halftime of his uh, battle against the Madigan machine. Right. He used, sure. you know, that terminology, he played through his greatest hits of all of his goals, property tax reform, term limits. Um, you know, he touted, like you said, education reform, leaving out a lot of nuance there, of course. But, um, you know, he said, we've lo won some, we've lost some, but our fight's not over. Illinois, our right. home is worth and fighting for. What, and what's interesting, and Matt brought it up, so there's this ad that paid for by the Rauner campaign mm -hmm. with Indiana Governor Eric, no, Indiana Governor Eric Holcomb, Missouri Governor Eric Greetens, if I'm pronouncing that right, and Wisconsin's Governor Scott Walker, all saying, thank you, Mike Madigan, yeah. which is bringing on the Rauner theme. Thank you, Mike Madigan, for raising taxes in Illinois. Again, Rauner was okay with that level of taxes under a previous plan, but now he says it should be rolled back and they only did it over my veto. And he's bragging about this education reform bill that he right. signed that couldn't have happened if you didn't have that tax increase. That's also true. And, okay. and also, thank you, Mike Madigan, for blocking Bruce Rauner's reforms, because right. our states are doing great. And I did a column, I just found it very odd <coughs> I think it's, I saw it and first thought very effective commercial because these governors are smiling and, and forceful talk. On the other hand, they are basically paid for by Bruce Runner to say Illinois is bad for business. Right. And that's just 
how weird is that? Right. And, and will it? And week. might it work? Might <laughs> it work in the? You know, we also know Bruce Rauner recently. Uh, I think gave either he or his campaign or somebody gave the Republican Party of Illinois four and a half million dollars and said this is the f the retire Madigan fund. Mm -hmm. They want to eat away at. Um, the Democratic control of the legislature. They won some seats in 2016. Now, 2018 is going to be the year in Illinois where um, we don't know what's going to happen with Donald Trump being in the White House. Right. And if Illinois, which has trended Democratic in national elections, if there will be a very demo big Democratic uh, vote that could hurt Rauner's plans to try to take over the legislature from the Democrats when they still have overwhelming majorities. Any thoughts? Uh, well, you still are dealing with a very gerrymandered uh, legislative map in Illinois for state races. Rauner made some pretty significant gains in 2016 uh, on the legislative front. I think it's going to hurt him as a statewide, Republican running statewide. Uh, I think the Democrats are going to be out in force. Uh, that, that's just kind of the pattern. Yeah. You know, well, the I congressional think races, I think, are going to be big this year because of the presidential. And um, we'll, we'll just have to look at that. Um, and let's see. Uh, do we think Jean Ives is going to run against Bruce Rauner? Well, I mean, she's allegedly forming an exploratory committee, but she won't talk about it yet. Um, but she only has six weeks to collect all the signatures. Uh, and you need 5,000 good ones to run yeah. statewide, as I recall. And it, I mean, it doesn't sound like a lot, but there's a lot of rules and regulations, right. and it takes a lot of manpower to collect those signatures. Right. I will just say at the end, uh, the, the House tried, uh, heard something about banning bump stocks for gun legislation, yeah. but it was a very wide open piece of legislation that gun owners said would ban maybe half the guns in Illinois, and they have to narrow it, so we'll see there'll be more on that in the future. We're about out of time. Matt Dietrich and Hannah Meisel, thank you very much for discussing this with me. Thank you for watching. I'm Bernie Schoenberg, and we'll see you next time on Capitol View.